Well, certainly uh, one of the more remarkable stories in soccer center out, centers around a town of 35,000. The town is Kearney, so dubbed Soccer Town USA. Uh, three of the top players in the history of American soccer emerged from this town, all at the, pretty much the same time. John Harks, Tony Miola, and Tab Ramos. Uh, Tom McCabe, he's from South Orange, you know, down the road a piece, and uh, he was a goalkeeper at Princeton under Bob Bradley. He's a soccer historian and professor in the history department at Rutgers Newark. Uh, he, he teaches a class, Global Soccer History. I, I wish I had that class available at the University of Georgia. It was not. No one talked about <laughs> soccer in Georgia in the 70s. We had the Atlanta Chiefs, though. But anyway, uh, he was inspired to do this documentary, and it's aptly called Soccer Town USA. Tom, uh, welcome to the program, and, uh, and congratulations on the documentary. Uh, thanks so much. I really appreciate it, and it's great to be here with uh, two out of the three guys. So uh, thanks for having me. Well, I, we've talked about this together a couple of times on, on the podcast, on Sirius XMFC, but uh, yeah, but not with the protagonists uh, at hand. So no Tom Ramos, but first we've got John Harks, current head coach of the Greenville Triumph in USL League One. Started his pro playing career with the Albany Capitals, if I have that right. Over 350 appearances as a pro. Sheffield United, Derby, West. Aye, 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 aye. Yeah, I know. DC United, the Reds. Oh, Sheffield Columbus. Wednesday. Sheffield Wednesday. Don't <laughs> swear at me on this program. Do I did that on purpose. No, you got me. You got me last time on that. Tony, program. get my back, Tony. I need yeah, my Yeah, that's back. that's a big mistake right there. Hey, that's can like I saying that's like saying we were from Harrison. Right. That, <laughs> oh, okay. the I got you. I got you. No, I won't make that mistake anymore. Hey, can I do the proper introduction here, guys? Jeez. All right. Uh, 90 appearances, national team for Harks, uh, part of that uh, team uh, that qualified for the World Cup for the first time in 40 years. Tony Miola was part of that team. All right, Tony, you can come in now. Uh, he, uh, like Harks, he played at the University of Virginia. Although you guys didn't play together at all, right? Did you just miss each That's other? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, all right. Yeah, John's a lot years. older than me. You got to watch the documentary to hey, figure that out. Hey, respect your elders. <laughs> What is it? Tony and Sal go to the bleachers as eighth graders coming down to some get where that was that print was that a Princeton? That was that, that, that was at Princeton. Princeton, yeah. Now yeah. what was that? That was a state final, mm -hmm. Carney State yeah. final? Wow. 1982 state final against yeah. Freehold. So we've got uh Mule and Harks are both MLS uh, originals, 1996. Tony now uh, he works for Fox, did the World Cup in 18, one of their lead analysts. He's co-host of the popular counterattack show on Sirius XMFC, a show that he and Harksy started together yeah that's that's pretty wild guys so yeah. well here we are together i, I really want to give this uh, i know a lot of people have seen the documentary i've heard some people that haven't seen it but are talking about it and uh, we're still in uh, somewhat of a quarantine period so let's uh, let's push this thing out and, and tell the story a little bit uh, tom you first i i w w what exactly how did you exactly come to the conclusion that this story needs to be told well, I grew up around the story and I knew these guys. I competed against Tony and Sal and, you know, some of the others along the way. So I, I knew it from, you know, a, a nearby town story uh, in South Orange, Maplewood. And then, you know, in college, graduate school, I started to study the history of the game and then led to a book project. And a couple of years into the book project, uh, I get a call from a Carney native, Kiko Doran. He says, hey, I hear you're writing a book. I want to do a documentary. And I said, so do I. I'd always been a, a big fan. I mean, total novice to this. Uh, and we started, you know, kind of kicking this, you know, idea down the road. And, you know, the, the three guys plus so many others were really cooperative. We had to interview them three times. And I think by the third time, you know, we finally got it right. You know, the look, you know, the, the interview questions. So they're probably bored of, uh, you know, fielding them the same questions over and over again. But it, it really comes from... I think from a very young age, I would go into the Kearney and it was this kind of this mystical, magical soccer place, unlike any other that I had been to. And to kind of demystify that, tell the story of this place and these three friends and the World Cup, I, I think was a natural. Uh, and we were just, you know, fortunate to be stewards of the story. John, you you have told the story probably a number of different ways uh, a, a lot of times, but do you ever get the uh... 
does it ever get old to just recount what was you know a really remarkable time in the not just in New Jersey but but in the history of the game for us yeah i it's a, a really special special time for us and um you know for tony and and tab uh for many of our friends you know robert mccord billy galk tommy McEwen, jerry McEwen, mike o'neill i mean larry hart i mean the, the list goes endless and so many quality players but even pl quality players glenn uh referring back to your comment uh in the history of the game you know prior to our our era you know um, I competed against my older brother. You know, he competed against Jerry McEwen, Joe Ellsmore. They competed against Marty O'Malley, it, Stephen McLean. I mean, it, and it goes all the way, all the way back to the first World Cup and just the immigration um, and uh, the whole process, I think, of just being such a melting pot in that particular area of, of so many dynamic backgrounds. Uh, but everybody globally connected through soccer um and i think that's that what tom said was the thing about carney in the surrounding area there was so many great quality players that came out of new jersey we talk about danny donegan peter vermes like the list is endless you know um but you look at that one specific town if you focus on that alone there was some grit and determination that were there and there was this fight and it was a chip on your shoulder kind of me uh, mentality. And I think that carried with us throughout all each of our careers, you know, whether we played together or against each other in major league soccer later in life. Um, and I, I think that's what propelled us to the next level. And it propelled us to qualify for 90 world cup and to represent really well in 94. And that type of platform that we were looking for all along was how do we grow the game in our country and still get the respect. And through the documentary, I think Tom and Kiko and many of his staff have done a excellent job of capturing that and putting it in the bottle of a documentary. And I, I think we've had so many great positive feedbacks uh, from, from many people about the story. Some, some knew the story, and some didn't even know the story. Just They just said they're soccer fans. So um, I think we're always going to have St. Louis and all these other different areas around the world that, that say that they are the soccer towns. But I think the, the documentary captures quite a bit of the history of the game, which I love. And I love finding out even more through Tom and you know his vision, his perspective on, on the film. Uh, but it was really well done. And I'm just happy to be a, a small part of the history of the game with that. It's fantastic. Tony, did you, uh, before you saw the documentary, were you that aware of, of the, the history, like the late 19th century, the immigrants coming uh, across, and uh, a lot of that 1930 team, the first World Cup, were, uh, you know, players that had uh, emigrated and were, were part of that team? I mean, were you, or did you just find about that in dribs and drabs along the way? Well, growing up, I, I wasn't very familiar with it. I, I can tell you that, but somewhere... <laughs> After I left high school, uh, I don't know if it was my college years or not, and, and Tom could probably speak better to sort of the timing here. In the Kearney Library, they put a uh, – uh, and Tom's shaking his head they, – they, they put this history of soccer – they put like a museum. Am I right, Tom? And in, in, in uh, the Kearney Library. And I remember going to the museum, and I, I actually went back a second day because there was so much information. I had stopped by thinking like, okay, I, I was running short on time. I had just come into town to see my parents. And I'm like, oh, this sounds pretty cool. Let me go to the Carney Library and check this thing out. And I only had a couple minutes and, you know, I ran by and I ended up going back a week later when I went to visit. I wasn't living in Kearney at that time. And I said, I got to go up to my parents a little bit earlier because I stopped at the Carney Library. Tom, do you, do you recall when about that was? And I remember it was a, you walked in, it was on the right hand side and there was just this row of sort of soccer history. And the first time I went in, I was like, man, there's a lot for me to learn, even having grown up in this place. But Tom, I feel like that was, that was like the mid eighties for some reason, maybe late eighties. 1990, um, George Rogers and Charlie Waller, two old timers who had been curating all that stuff, the artifacts, the history, the clippings, put together an exhibit. And then I've seen pictures of, of both of you kind of in front of those display cases at the, the Carney Library. And then upstairs, they had the Carney Museum. I'm sure he went there as grade schoolers, yeah, yeah. right? So it was kind of a combination 
and a lot of that stuff is still there. Some of it's been donated to the National Soccer Hall of Fame, uh, but that was one way to kind of tell uh, the national story through the local history and, and Carney's place in it. So those two people in particular, Charlie Waller and George Rogers, were crucial to, to getting that story out in, in the 90s. And, and Carney, I've tried to find out the first time that Carney was called Soccer Town USA. And the earliest reference I have is 1985, when Billy Galka and John and could have been Robert McCourt were kind of first getting into the youth national teams. I think, you know, Marty O'Malley had done some stuff. And Mr. Mara, who was probably pecking his typewriter at work, was doing a newsletter, a Thistle newsletter. And it said, is Carney youth soccer town USA? You know, because of all these guys coming up in the state teams, region teams, the national teams. And then there's that sign and T-shirts that get made in between 90 and 94, right? You know, that's when the town brands itself as Soccer Town USA. So, John, what, uh, what, what, do, you, uh, what do you credit mostly all these great players? Uh, you talked about the, uh, you know, having the edge or however you describe that. Uh, you know, what was it? I mean, what, why, why, um, why so much success? You could say, well, it's people who had to play the game better because they came from overseas. I, I don't know. I think to sum it up, I have, I have three words. Three words I can sum that up for you, Glenn. Winners right. stay on. <laughs> yeah. Tony, you said, it. but Tony, you said, I learned more about competing at 10 years old than any other time in my life. Is that sort of what you're talking about there? No, no doubt. John, John just said it. Winners stay on. You go to the courts and if you want to play, you just got to keep winning. You got to keep kicking the shit out of everyone that you're playing. And, you know, I was, I was 10, 11, 12 when I started going to the courts and John will test the, I mean, John's, John's brother. I remember Jimmy was like a, to me was like a monster, you know, and, and I, I don't get really intimidated by, <laughs> by bigger guys, as you can probably imagine. And, and I can remember going, Oh man, I got to go on the field against him. Now I got to figure something out, right? Because the last thing I want to do, and, and John will tell you, there might have been 50 or 60 people down the court just kind of milling around, putzing around on the side, but waiting to get on. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm doing the math in my head, and I was really good at math. I'm like, oh man, each game takes like six minutes. And uh, if I don't win, like my next time on is like uh, 45 minutes from now, and I don't want to wait around. And that was kind of the mentality, right? And John, John, um, you never wanted to be the guy, Tony, that had to go get the Gatorades down at this the store. You never yeah, wanted to be no, that no guy. Doubt, that means no that doubt. you weren't you weren't on the pitch, and it was it was <laughs> terrible. You know, it's funny. John mentions this. My there was uh, John. Do you remember the the there was the holding sisters, Julie and another one. And I ended up my yeah. daughter ended up playing Louise. soccer. Lu, Julie and Louise. Then Glenn. This is funny. They lived like four doors down. And I told them years after when my daughter was was playing against one of their daughters in in uh, they were in there in Freehold at the time I was in Tom's River. And I said, Do you guys know that I used to be in your house all the time. And they're like, what do you mean you were in my house all the time. <laughs> and I said, well, we used to play at the courts and every time we needed to go, go get drinks. Someone told me at one point that your dad always left cases of Gatorade and soda on your back porch. So I used to go steal Gatorade and soda. So I could only had to walk like four houses down. I would come back. They're like, Oh, Tony, where'd you get all that? I'm like, ah, I just went and bought it all. <laughs> I was yeah. stealing all their Gatorade from their house. And I told her, they were cracking up. I told them years ago, my wife was like, are you kidding me? You went, I'm like, no, I'm not kidding you. I know exactly. If I went to the house today, I could tell you where the Gatorade was. <laughs> John, the, the courts, we don't want to assume that everybody knows, uh, you know, what the courts are. Can you, can you give us a picture? Just describe sure. what the courts were and, and the surroundings. And you mentioned 50 or 60 guys down there trying to battle it out. It was amazing. I think, you know, from that perspective, it, you know, it, it instilled in you that that fighting competitive edge where, you know, you did want to go. And, and like Tony said, there was a wide range of ages down there. So you could be a kid that was 11 or 12 and you're competing against somebody that's 20. I mean, talk about the difference there, you know, and it's like, um, let's make a deal O'Neill, Mike O'Neill, which you know really well. Mike would be the one that tried to organize the teams. And if 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 for whatever reason you just weren't on your game that day, 
you got a call that night and said, hey, make sure you wear the white T-shirt. And then Mike would call the other four guys that he wanted on his team and go, guys, we're all in green tomorrow. Everybody's in green tomorrow. <laughs> and he did it with everybody. And, and we were always like, hey, Mike, you were crap yesterday, so you're out. And, you know, we've got, <laughs> we're all wearing blue today. So there was a competitive um, edge to get onto those teams, to stay on the courts, to, to find out. And what ends up happening is when you have a big age gap and a difference, well, the physicality is number one, speed of play. You can't compete with that stuff. So like Tony said, you had to be clever. You had to figure out other ways. And the courts were, luckily for me, I was at the one end of the town there. It was a little bit more of a walking distance there. Um, but I do remember like who was going down at what times and bring your own ball and that type of thing. And it was fantastic. And people would just show up in numbers and it was a basketball court next to a tennis court on the other side. And the, the damage was done prior to us actually going down there. Somehow, I guess the story was that there was some basketball courts on there and they pulled those things down. <laughs> I don't know if that's a true story. I, I, have, but... I have that story. So in the Vietnam era, so this goes back, even a right. generation before these guys, there were tennis courts there. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they would, you know, rock the stanchions for the nets, pull them up, roll them up and put them off to the side. And then the next day, the tennis nets would be up. So there was this back and forth negotiation between like Huey O'Neill and, and Santi and others. And then finally, one day, the boys show up and the holes for the tennis stanchions are filled in. So soccer won, right? I mean, I guess the, the punchline there is like, who's playing tennis in Harrison, right? I mean, so right. this was, you know, the kids in the town saying, we want to play soccer. And, and it's got to be one of those longest running places where a pickup has happened from the early 1960s all yeah. the way to today. And it was in some theories, and I don't know if you guys agree with this or not, and, and Tony back me up here. It was sort of like the Mad Max theory. Two men enter, one man leaves. Like when you entered that, it was a big high fence and it was all the way around. And there were times where, I mean, even in one corner, there's a big tree that's coming out of the, the ground. We would use that tree to go around to hide <laughs> from some of the bigger players and draw them out. So you had to be clever. And it was funny because once you know, like Tony said, like once you went in there, you just wanted to stay in there. That was it. So you fought for every game. Every so this play is, meant something. This is at, on asphalt, right? I mean, I've seen the, the yeah. clips. And, uh, so, yeah. And, so and talk, Glenn, by, by the way, there was uh, at one point, if you guys remember, the one that they, they ended up building this beautiful asphalt hockey um, uh, arena right near the Gunnel Oval, just on the top side of the Gunnel Oval. And when that was new, it was like the new toy on the block, right? Where you, all of a sudden, everyone went to this hockey arena for a while until we completely trashed the nets from hitting soccer balls at it. I don't think there was, I, I, I lived near that one. I don't think I ever once saw a hockey game ever <laughs> go on in that place. Every I agree time with I ever you, Tony. That was, that was called Emerson. And Emerson, we would go to, yeah. we would go to Emerson. Yeah when there was a larger number of crowd of guys because it was bigger than the course. It was a lot right. longer stretched out. Um, and, and that was, that was true because when it was smaller numbers, it was all rotating, rotating down at the course. Yep. And at the yep. other end, it was bigger. All right. We're talking yeah. soccer town USA, the documentary, Tom McKay, the producer, and we've got uh, John Harks and uh, Tony Miola uh, talking about Kearney, New Jersey and uh, you know, the kind of players that emerged from there. So for you guys, so now you're, the, the whole thing, I, I, the Cosmos part of the documentary, uh, you know, that I was at those games, so it, it meant a lot to me to see. Uh, but I was not a – I didn't know the Carney boys at that time yet. And, uh, wow, how about having that in your backyard? And all of a sudden – I mean, your fathers must have gone nuts, right? I mean, they're, they're like, you know, they came here. They're trying to keep get that culture going in your town and maybe – spread it a bit. I know, uh, John, your father was, uh, you know, co I, I think your first coach, right? And, yeah. and coached, uh, um, Thistle, but what was that like? Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, I mean, that was, uh, the best thing in the world for us. It was right in our backyard and, uh, that everything focused around the schedule of the cosmos, everything did. Mm. Um, and even our youth games and stuff like that, I think we got frustrated. We, we couldn't get over there in time to make sure we kicked it around the parking lot and, uh, Tony, I think it was, what were we at? 
13 B. 13, 13, yeah. And, uh, same spot each time. Well, of course, same spot each time. It's just uh, yeah. Years. And we would always show up there, and like we'd be knocking it around, and it'd be fantastic. Wow. And we'd go there hours before the game if we could. And the days that we couldn't get there, and and you know there were certain days too that was like, um, like we had to find out who was going over, so we can like bum a ride, you know. And so that that was all part of it. And that was just uh, those are the glory days for us because that. Having that in your backyard, having that exposure to that and that some of the best players in the world, it was a world all-star team coming together in the Cosmos, to be yeah. fair. And was seeing there those a, players. Was there, and, I was going to say, was there a player that really stood out to you, John? And I want to ask you, Tony, I, mean, I, I, I always remember Birkenmeier uh, in goal, but uh, anybody that you, uh, you fashioned yourself after? after yeah, there watching? was this guy, and he didn't get a lot of credit, but he was, to me, stood out. Pele, I don't know if you heard of him. <laughs> okay. All right, you went for the easy one. No, but he was inspiring, and and I was I got to be a ball boy for a few a few number of games, and got my Progresso ball boy little kit and everything, and I loved it. And uh, <laughs> and it was green, and it had yellow on the end. You never wanted to get it near a spark because it would have went up in flames. Um, but Pele in the in the dressing room and coming out of the tunnel and just being able to see him and shake his hand was like. Man, that, that was awe-inspiring. And I was like, you know, Canalia was there and Franz Beckenbauer I thought was awesome. And I took his number, number six, like my brother had from Beckenbauer because he used to be five with Germany. But he always wore six with the Cosmos. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of quality players there. And I think the gritty part of it, too, was Santiago Formoso was really the guy that was in our town that represented our area pretty well that made that team. And so we were able, like a friend of mine, Richie Santos, who ran Stasha Subhouse for a while. I don't know if he still does, Tony. I don't, he I does. No I was there. I was there a month ago. Believe it or not, John. He he's still there. He's back on Carney Ave. <laughs> Is he really? Po- and your poster. And that was your his posters. Cousin. Huh? Your posters are still hanging. Oh, in John, there they're the they're wilting away our posters. <laughs> the, the sun has wilted them. But but we it, as as the 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 posters wilt, John, we get skinnier. We just keep getting skinnier and skinnier as the, the sun. I'm in the best shape of my life from all my Zoom team workouts, man. It's unbelievable. Yeah. If I don't join in, the players are, like, not enthusiastic. I'm, like, dying. My, my, yeah. my performance coach is pushing me right now. It's good. Well, it's I've, fun. I've got- uh, you mentioned those Cosmo days. For me, it was you, Rupert Berkemeyer, and then our, that relationship has been for a long time. He came to see me play. Um, actually, he was doing an appearance. Um, he didn't come to see me play. He ended up seeing me play. If you guys remember, we played indoor soccer at Rockland Community College, which was oh, yeah. the coolest uh, 6v6 tournament. You couldn't wait to play every week. And he was doing an appearance, and he stuck around and watched from up above. You could never go on the field. You had to watch from, yeah. um, I don't know if it was a running track or just a walking track up above. And all the parents had to kind of look down, and that's what kind of made it cool and he, he waited for me. He was with my parents when I came up and he said, man, this kid's got some athletic ability. And from that point on, he always followed me. And I still talk to Hubert. Um, I send messages through uh, Leko Eskandarian, whose dad, uh, uh, Eski, Eski was yeah. uh, a partner, is a partner with him in a business. And, they, and we've, we've kept in touch. He was one of those guys. He was, he was like untouchable to me. You know, he's the guy I wanted to get to, but I could never get to as a kid, you know, and everyone has those, those guys in their life and uh he he was yeah. that guy for me but the memories for me that the amazing the, the amazing thing about this whole journey of this um of this movie and and watching it is that i don't know john how you felt but when i was growing up what we were doing just seemed normal like if you would have said to me yeah they're doing this in harrison and they're doing it in north arlington and they're doing it down in you know virginia i would have thought everyone's doing the same thing but it really wasn't that way we were like we grew up in an area that that was kind of special in that regard but i but i would have thought the entire country well hell, we didn't know anything right we i would have thought everyone was doing it we were really really lucky to be doing all this yeah i agree with that i i think we were a bit naive to what was around us for sure um we were trying to find fields to always play and kick the ball around, whether it was a Quartz, Emerson, Gunnar Lovell. Um, then Harvey Field came into play, which was great. But there's also a lot of talent times, even down at the Gunnar Lovell, Tony, we'd be on the out, out uh, fields of the baseball and we'd get kicked off of there and uh, get chased by the cops. And, and we kind of, I think we did. I agree with you. I, I think we kind of grew up thinking like that's normal. Like this is how everybody else is. And then 
when we did travel to other, you know, um, cities or even other states or, you know, um, out of town or whatever it may be, it was like, wow, well, it's not, not a lot of people love the game like this. So I just think it was like a generational situation, you know, uh, people that have been exposed to it, you know, are uh, before us. And I think that got passed down and then the competitive edge. And for me personally was competing against my brother being three years older. And we actually played them in a semifinal of a state game and we beat them in penalties because my dad put That's us great. up into their age bracket. And my brother didn't talk to me for like three weeks, but we still <laughs> laugh about it today. He and I, it's, it's hilarious, but that competitive edge, I think pushes you and drives you. And it was also a, it, it was a, um, you wanted to show that you belonged, you know, you wanted to be part of the group, the cool guys. And that was the soccer. And that was the soccer players. You know, there's, we, we talk a lot about high school soccer these days and, you, you know, the development academy, things that have gone on there where the high school was not permitted. I think one of the more remarkable parts of the documentary is, is, the, is the following that you had in town for your high school games. Like on the road, John Miller, I, I remember at one point he said, you know, we had far more people in the stands when we did road games, no matter where you went. So, Tom, that was uh, – you know, I think you really captured that well, you know, and Mule as an eighth grader riding in a bus with a kegs in the back and whatever, whatever was going on there. To I mean, get that, to his those, that, that storyline just came together, right? When we heard the Grant Pearson story and then Tony and Sal get pulled out, you know, as eighth graders to go to the championship game. And then um, you, know. you, you call it pulled out. We skip school. Let's just call it what it is. Right. <laughs> we skip school. We didn't get pulled out of anywhere. <laughs> right. Right. The euphemism pulled out. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, th that was a great way to, to sh show, you know, how important high school soccer was you know, the civic pride that, that came along with it, you know, ordering of buses and caravans and, you know, the pre-gaming and then, you know, the, you know, the, the cheering, the chanting, the heckling that, that went into it all. I mean, one of the, the key things, I don't know if you've seen it in one of your, you know, corny text chains, a picture surfaced of the Carney army taken from a freehold camera. And literally in this frame, there's probably 50 to 100 people walking across the field in between the quarters, right? Because you had heard this kind of mythic Carney Army, you know, they're, after each quarter, they're going to follow the goalkeeper, and then back again, back again. And, you know, I hear this story over and over and over again. And I'm like, is it true? I mean, it must be. I keep hearing it. And then after the fact, we found this photograph that was sent from someone who watched it in Freehold to a Freehold friend of mine. And then it came to me. And I was like, wow, it's true. Myth just, is reality. The carrying of the kegs across wow. the field. I mean, at a high school game, it's, just, it's really, uh, it's something. Uh, <laughs> Hearts yeah, at your town, man. You just throw your hands up in the air and you're like, wow. I hope that, at the end of the day, it was like, yeah, we played well. And everybody wanted to make sure how the game went and the score of the game. And then the next question was, you know, anybody get arrested? <laughs> so, that was it take a toll no nope, no nope, he's still here he's still here okay good good all right and that was yeah. it so uh, oh, tom wow. is now wow. giving us a there it is wow that's between Very quarters cool. and that's back when high school soccer was played four quarters four quarters right yeah, yeah that was in between so when i saw that i was like there's the proof you know because we didn't have any of it in the video which was another godsend right you're all as a historian, as a filmmaker, you're beholden to the sources. Like, how can you show this, you know, on the screen, right? And we've heard all these great stories. And then, oh, there's close circuit, you know, freehold local TV of this game. And somebody has it. And there are pictures of the crowd. You know, that type of thing really kind of brings it to life and, and shows it. And, Tom, I want to thank you for including all the Thomas McEwen comments uh, during the course of the documentary. <laughs> <laughs> It's just classic. I'm the unexpurgated. I'm glad you just left it all in and uh, no, yeah. no bleeps or beeps, you know, it was just a uh, pure Thomas. Oh, uh, I, I remember that, that night, you know, as I said earlier, we interviewed everybody three times. And I think by the third time, Thomas was comfortable enough to kind of, I remember he looks to the right, looks to the left. He goes, can I really tell you what I think? I'm like, yeah, that's really what we want. <laughs> I think, you know, that's what he we said, wanted. you know, everybody 
hated Carney, you know, and uh, it just rolled from there. And he had some memorable bites, but you had to sprinkle those in, right? You couldn't every time go to him for the punchline, right? And, right. Yeah. Uh, no, you did it well. I, mean, I, I think you he, did it very well. Yeah. He, you did he, it very well. And I, I did a Zoom call with Thomas uh, about 10 days ago and Robert and a couple of guys and Thomas just kept going. Yeah, nothing for nothing, but uh, I just look like a thug. <laughs> we're, all like, we're all like sitting there like, all right, yeah, well, um, if the shoe fits, big man, you know, and he was like, ah. you know, well, He's got a huge heart. Let's, uh, you know, let's. Oh, no, he's, sure. he's, yeah. he's great. I actually thought the way you portrayed him and uh, got him to speak about it brings like the raw, real passion, genuine one passion of like what what he believed in and who he was because Thomas was a great player in himself you know so what did it mean to you uh so Tony how the town followed you John and Tab as you you got your careers emerged there was no professional soccer the Cosmos and the NASL died so you, you you're you know you're starting to get into the prime of your careers and all I had to latch on to is the national team were going overseas uh which which both of you did as well so, but what was it like having the town behind you like that? I mean, did that, was that, you know, we, we heard, I don't know if it was you, John or Tab in, in the, uh, in the documentary talk about how, you know, you were playing for the town because you could really feel that. Yeah. I mean, you were playing because I think, um, you know, John mentions Thomas McHugh and then that group of guys and, and Rob McCord, you know, Rob McCord has had a great uh, career after uh, playing, you know, I, I go to the Sal Rose Amelia's and the, in the, you know, Robert Arenas and Paul Mullins is the guys that were in my um, age group. We, we were doing what every single one of those players wanted to do in their life. That's all we talked about, right? And, and all of a sudden, the World Cup is like around the corner. You know, just, just the thought of it, even saying it to you now, just kind of sounds, it sounds weird. You know, that, mm -hmm. that all of a sudden, all we, you talk about this with, uh, with your buddies and myself and Sal and Robert Arena, the only, probably only three Italians I don't know that ever lived in Kearney, if it, for, for that matter. Yeah, where was you, that neighborhood? I mean, did, or did, were you all clustered in, in, a, in a little row, or no, where was that? No, we were all spread out uh, all around uh, all around Kearney. Sal oh. and I lived fairly close, uh, about two blocks away, but everyone else, all our, our other friends were, were sort of spread out, and I think that was sort of the beauty of the, the town and getting together. Everyone was coming. You could, I mean, if you could just picture everyone walking to a court from a different part of town and knowing, um, I, I think for me, Glenn, the, the most, there was one line that stuck out to me in the entire um, uh, film, and that was Mike O'Neill's line. We had training at Thistle every Tuesday and Thursday, but we played soccer three times a day before we even went to training. Played before school started, we played at lunchtime, and then we played after school. And we played so much pickup. There was always a place to play. I just thought that was normal. I was the outcast, to be honest, because I, I for a short portion of the year in the spring, I literally would jump fences down the Gunnel Oval and get onto the baseball field and play baseball for a little while. And I'd watch my friends. I mean, they were, geez, how far was the soccer field was in the outfield of the, the fields I used to play on. And they'd be playing soccer. So halfway through the inning, as the baseball game was going on, I'm watching the soccer game, and I'm thinking, man, this game get over quick enough. I can jump back over there and play a little bit more soccer. And um, <laughs> it just that's all you did. I, there was, there was, I, I the, the thing I dislike most about what happens in the in this country. And you know what? I've heard it from so many different managers and guys in youth development. And you guys have probably heard the same thing. There's none of that anymore. Right. There's no just love of the game and go play. Everything is organized. And we didn't have I, I don't know. Did John, did you ever know a rule? Was there ever a rule? Did we ever play? Did we have a rule? No, it was just go and win. And that's it. And there was there a time limit. No, there was no time limit. There was nothing. You just played until you felt like you had enough for the day. Right. And that was like the purity of, of what we did. But that line from Mike O'Neill, and, and I think I got it pretty close, Tom, to, to what he said. Right. Is. We played three times before we we actually had soccer practice. That doesn't happen anymore. No, it doesn't. And, uh, you know, we've talked about it, Tony. I, I probably talked about it with all of you, just the ability to replicate that. It's 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 nearly impossible now. Do the courts still exist? I mean, are, are, are people hopping on and playing? I mean, what is that still going on? Tom? Emerson uh, is not, right, Tom? Emerson yeah, has Emerson, now the apartment building. Right. Yeah. I know that. 
I mean, the landscape has changed, but some of the, the, the places are still there. I mean, the Gunnel Oval has now been beautifully restored with field turf. You wouldn't recognize it. It's no longer the Dust Bowl that That's it once fun. was. Yeah. Um, I know. Take the fun out turf, of it. Yeah. You know, turf at Harvey Field, you know, turf on the high school field where you guys played, you know, turf on the courts. Then there are new courts, you know, down by the Passaic River. So there's a lot of spaces that kids can play on. And they're all turf, right? I, and I, I think that's one of the great equalizers between, you know, the, the, the colder climes and the warmer climes in the United States, right? Now in New Jersey and, and other colder places, you can play year-round because of the field turf. Yeah, but um, does anybody – are they going out there? Are they going out there at lunchtime? I, I'm just, I'm, I wonder. Yeah. I, wouldn't it be amazing if part of the, the this gift of the film would be that kids are starting to do that before school, at lunch? I mean, Kearney is still one of the few places where you can see soccer lines um, on the blacktops behind the schools, in the schoolyard. Oh, cool. Hmm. That is cool. Well, you guys, you know, before we close, I just – the national team stuff is, uh, you know, really remarkable. And the, the fact that you guys were, uh, were there and played and part of uh, the first team to qualify in 40 years, you were in Trinidad. And I wonder, uh, Tony, was there any irony to you that in Trinidad, that was one of the great moments in U S soccer history. And then it was in Trinidad where we failed to qualify for 2018. Well, I don't think they forgot. That's for sure, right? It's been going on for a long time. It's funny you mentioned that Trinidad game just just yesterday. We we've got uh, coming up. We got Paul Caligiuri. We're going to do some uh, some stuff with here. So I was doing a little bit of research, and I saw a six minute clip, and I literally went downstairs, and my wife we were getting ready to eat dinner, and I said I was just watching this clip, and I said, man, John, in that in that, and of course you don't go back and watch these things. Oftentimes. You did so much running in that game. I can't imagine how you got through uh, the entire – it was amazing. Just in the five- or six-minute clip – now, we were chasing the ball quite a bit in some of those clips, man. But I, I, I hope that we get back to um, sort of as a national team, and you mentioned the failure to qualify, is that that part of it is a staple. And, and, and we did I, – I did something with, uh, with our good friend Michael Lewis yesterday – and he talked about the grit and desire. And he said to me something that was really, really weird, which I haven't heard my entire career. He said, um, how much did you guys talk about that part of the game? I said, we didn't really talk about that part of the game. That was kind of inherent, right? That was, that's a staple where you just outwork each, the other guy. That's, that's got to be automatic for me. Um, and again, it, it, that goes back at least to, uh, at least for the three of us, I would imagine, um, how we grew up and where we grew up and, and what you saw in this film. Like we didn't, John, did we ever have a discussion about, Hey, we got to work harder than that? No, you just, you, and you, especially of all people, you just worked harder than everybody. Right. But that was, no one had to tell you to work harder. You just did it. Yeah. I think it's a good point, Tony. It was, it was instilled in all of us. Like if you want something, you're going to have to work for it. And that was that blue collar mentality, you know, growing up in that, that town and, you know, I, I, I agree with you 100%. It's a good point. Um, there were a number of times where that wasn't discussed. And even now when I do these Zoom calls and as a leadership group and we talk to different coaches and stuff, the best, you know, leaders in, in any sport and the, these coaches that were before us, the Vince Lombardi's and all of these coaches, they never talked about winning either. They just talked mm -hmm. about the process of winning and how to compete because the rest of that would take care of itself. And I think... We, we grew up knowing like what it meant to win games and compete and stuff, but I learned more as a younger player in my failures, in my failures, when I didn't do well. And when I missed a penalty kick at 15 years old in indoor at Kearney High School and our team lost that game, that stayed with me forever. And I thought I better be better at my penalty kicks from now on. So I would work on them. So that, that kind of helped me a lot. And uh, just the examples we had and character and the love for the game, like Tony mentioned, is very true. That was just there. It was a natural ingredient that was in our veins. And I think that helped propel us to the next levels, you know, and we're really fortunate to be fair, Tony, Tab and I, because we did have the support of the whole, the whole town and a lot of it in the state, state of New Jersey. We really did. Even though it was competitive to high school and back in the day, 
we had a lot of people support us and uh, we, could, we couldn't have gotten where we were without those people because they gave us confidence. They really did to believe in ourselves. I, I love the part with the uh, Caligiri, who I've become friendly with, but the uh, Southern California boy, you know, he's a surfer boy, snorkeler. And uh, he was like, where, what is this carny? Where is this carny? You know, it's perfect. It's perfect. No well, one that's why we threw um, him in the water in the 1990 rap video. Right, right. <laughs> he was trying to take the piss out of us. <laughs> <laughs> but but that, let me, let me put my historian's hat on. So in the 80s, you, California was the base of the national team, right? And then you see three things happen, right? Tab joins up first, then John, and then Tony, and they bring, you know, okay, I'm a historian with a Jersey bias, right? Um, they bring, you know, what we now call what Jersey grit, Jersey strong to the national team. And I don't think it's a coincidence that that team qualifies for the first time in, in 40 years when you have that spine, the goalkeeper and two of the guys in the middle of the park uh, that end up qualifying us and then proving themselves in 90 and then hosting that first world cup and, and having some epic matches. So uh, for me, it, as a historian, it makes sense that you had those three guys with this history and tradition and, and pride and work ethic uh, behind them. And they brought it to, to the big stage, to the national team. Well, uh, 94, uh, playing Colombia and winning that match. And that's depicted so well. And then the tragedy uh, that followed. But again, the whole town making their way to L.A. to the, uh, to the Coliseum for that. And, Tony, it was interesting that you, you, could, you spotted Sal Rosamil. You knew where he was sitting? Uh, I did no, no, I did not know. Oh, I was, okay. I was getting instruction from Bora on the bench. We, we were trying to organize some things and keep in mind that was two nil at that point. And right. I, I don't know, remember what the instruction was, but just over to the side of the bench. So I'm looking and you obviously can see the Rose bowl and you can imagine what it's like with all the people. And in that first row, there's a guy with his shirt off and that's Sal Rosamilia. And I'm thinking to myself, Holy cow. The, the so he's preparing to, uh, to, uh, you know, follow was, through on a bet, right? He was We had a bet going, um, and he was going to take his clothes off and he was going <laughs> to streak the field. Um, and he was halfway there, but I, it was amazing that I saw him and he actually, he recognized me. Obviously we made eye contact and like, we're in the middle of the game. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, Oh man, this, this isn't going to be good. So, I saved a lot of people a lot of trauma by giving up a goal against Columbia, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the funny things that came out of this with a watch party, so Kirk Rudell, college teammate of mine, we co-wrote and co-produced it. Um, he's out in L.A. He's running a girls' club. He's president of a girls' club out there, and they have a watch party for the, like, 2007s, 8s. And they're all texting back and forth. They're chanting USA, USA, because they don't know the outcome of the games and they're pulling for the national team. But their absolute favorite part was whether Sal was going to get the streak <laughs> or not. You know, of these 10 or 11 year olds, that was uh, what, what uh, the, their, their takeaway was. So you Is that, was, that the, uh, was that the streaking era? I know there was a period of time where it was happening all the time. I don't know. Was that, maybe that was it. He didn't look like anything like, what was her, the Morgana lady, the lady with, uh, that was in <laughs> Dow? Baltimore, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he didn't look like her, Glenn, that's for sure. <laughs> all right. Sal, well, to close. Uh, so, John, uh, tell us a little bit about your venture uh, in USL League One uh, in Greenville. Uh, obviously, this is a, a, an interesting time, intriguing time, uh, unfortunate, tragic in some ways, but you're trying to organize your team for what you're not even sure what will happen yet, I guess. So wh what's the latest in League One? Yeah, we are. Um, and, and again, it's it is uncharted territory uh, and, and there's state by state governance, which you guys know differs quite a bit. Uh, there's the CDC uh, guidelines and then there's the USL league guidelines that we're all trying to follow. And of course, you know, with major league soccer as well, um, that moratorium was set for tomorrow, the 15th for training and back to action. I've had many conversations with many coaches in all three leagues and uh, that's not going to happen, but we are training in small groups currently. Um, I just came off the fields today. Uh, we we kind of organized it a little bit better. The first uh, three days of training, we were out there. It was like a soccer camp, glorified pro soccer camp, 
We were out there from <laughs> eight in the morning. We finished at five at night. Oh, Coaches were exhausted. My body is falling apart. And what we're trying to do that's is back, – John, that's back in the days. I remember doing 10 straight weeks in the summer of soccer camp. Same kind of thing. And it's like, oh, my I, – I felt so bad for the kids in that 10th week because it was like, I, yeah. this, ha- this has to end. And it was, it was just that's what we're doing. But we have to – adapt to the current parameters and we have to be disciplined and it's it's very difficult because you know we play a sport for a reason and you know the way that I coach is I I I collaborate with the players I connect with them I make sure that they have a trusting platform and you know I'm there for them and um, right now we have to stay apart so there's no interaction there's and we train in groups of threes, and that's been difficult. You know, I talked. But can you explain. describe? Can you describe an exercise, an example of an exercise you're using with this group of three? And and can you can you can look at it, but you can't really coach it. What's what's the exact? Yeah, what's the exact. You're allowed, you're allowed to be there and observe. You okay. know, so um, you know, it, it's different phases of the game, from a dynamic warm up to a passing exchange. It's everything in, that you can think of. You're trying to get these guys and there is one group of four because they all live together. So that makes sense. Mm. Uh, And that's why we're able to train like that. I talked to Richie Williams, Bruce Arena at at New England. They're like supposed to be one man, one ball in a, in a quad grid and they can't go near anybody else. And so there's different parameters with everybody. Um, And we just trying to set up, you know, whether it's triangle passing and then you, you try to be creative and share ideas uh, with some of the players. Like what else can you do to manipulate in this system, this system? And then they go, Oh, maybe I can do this and come off and get a double pass and then turn here. And then they start figuring things out. So you give ownership of the game to them, which is great because we almost have to right now. So it it varies. Then there's a finishing exercise. Maybe if that group, that group has a goalkeeper or not, you can't rotate them to somebody else. Can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Tony, what are you you hearing? Uh, What's the latest MLS uh, going to Orlando June 1st? Uh, What do you got? Yeah, I mean, that's that's what we're hearing is that they're coming to uh, the state of Florida. Um, there's facilities there that can accommodate them, not only on the field, but off the field. Uh, the, the I think the tricky part is that sort of group of thousand uh, of a thousand people total um, to keep them isolated for two months uh, is really I mean, is really going to be um, uh a really difficult task and how you manage that I don't know and and I think there's there's going to come a point at some level you know sort of the country's going to have to have to take a leap of faith whether it's a month from now whether it's a month and a half from now where it's never really going to be perfect um, and then but you've got to at some point we've got to make the next jump because I think this is uh this is, is draining on everybody at the moment, right? You see it everywhere you go. You see it when you talk to people and the way that they answer you about how their sort of emotions are right now. It's a tough time. Um, I can't imagine, and I've said this time and time again, and John's just kind of talking about it from a coaching standpoint, I can't imagine being a player in this period, thinking that you've got to keep yourself fit and try to motivate yourself every day. Um, it's got to be so difficult on those guys. Yeah, I mean, we do Zoom team workouts twice a week. We all join in. Everybody's on them. Uh, the mental health aspect is very, very critical right now. Sure. So we do have not just the coaches talking to players and one-on-one, and we Zoom everything. Everything's changed. The platform isn't texting anymore. The platform is FaceTime or Zoom. So that it we really have has, that connection. It's good. It really has changed the way we're going to uh, connect and uh, communicate with our with our players now, right? I yeah, mean, you have to. It you makes sense. To. Everything's changed. Everything's changed. I just want to share a text that I just got from one of my captains. Okay. I can't believe this. I'm watching Soccer Town USA. You never told me about that. This is awesome. Maybe I should start <laughs> stuffing my boots with newspaper. Ah, that's, are you kidding? That's good. Aaron that's Walker. Good. That's, that's great, that. man. That is Maybe great. I should start stuffing them with newspaper. That's why he's your captain. He's a smart guy. See, he is a smart guy. <laughs> there you go, Tom McCabe. There you go. That's what an endorsement. Perfect. And uh, Tom, tell us uh, it's it's now available. I know it's on YouTube. And uh, if you have to close this for us uh, uh, in a couple of paragraphs, why should somebody uh, watch Soccer Town USA? I think if they've listened to all this and watched all this, they would understand. How well, would you put it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's simple. You know, yeah, it's a story about soccer. But I think fundamentally, it's a story about friendship and how these three guys and this town behind them 
get them to their dream, you know, and it's a very American town, you know, playing not necessarily a very American game. So there are some, some twists and, you know, kind of looking at it from, from a different angle. Um, the question we're always getting is, well, my town's a soccer town, you know, John mentioned it before, St. Louis or San Diego or Seattle, right? So I, I will say we have a draft uh, of a proposal uh, for a new project going forward, uh, Soccer Towns USA. So we've ah. uh, selected our starting 11, Carney plus 10. And, yeah, uh, thank you. We'll, thank uh, you for keeping that real, Tom. Yep, we appreciate yep, that. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and, and then I think people go, oh, why Carney? Why is it Soccer Town USA? And I think it's because the best case is three guys went to multiple World Cups together. Sorry. That's, that's it. And 90, Tom, 94. Tom, yeah. did any of them, any of those towns have high schoolers and eighth graders carrying kegs across the field? That's all that you have. Forget the soccer part, my friend. They, they carry kegs across the field. Hey, Tom, I'm Tony, guess but no. one of the best parts in that film is when the, the woman's talking about the 94 World Cup and they're getting the tickets that you go organize the buses. And Tommy, Tommy McEwen goes, look, lady, I don't know if I'm in B4 or this bus or that bus. We're all going on and we got to yeah. move over. <laughs> um, uh, Phil Serns is still my friend, by the way, even though his house was trashed and he needed yeah. six months to get it all redone again. But he's still my uh, dear friend. Hey, all, all kidding aside with everything, Glenn, thank you for giving us this platform to share our stories. But Tom... Big thanks to you for all the yeah, work thanks, you did Bill. for Tony and I, Tab, and our town and our families. The way you represented not just us, but the respect for the game, uh, you propelled it to the next level. So thank you. Well and said. I, and I don't think either one of you were at the premiere. I mean, the, the pipe, the pipes. There was a piper that led us from the wherever we drank. The bar to in the, the town to and then the, brought us to the Scandinavia to the, house. Glenn, we yeah. could. In. We couldn't get into the premiere. It was you packed. Could, uh, okay. We you weren't allowed were in. Allowed. We were late. <laughs> I was texting you guys. I was sending you. Yeah. I sent you a video, Hart. I think I sent you both a video. You of did. You sent me a video. Yeah. Yeah. Normally, I would push Tony in front of me. He was always the one that his shoulders couldn't fit through the door frame, you know? If we had any issues, we're like, talk to the big man. <laughs> All right, John Harks, Tony Miola, Tom McCabe. Tom, again, Great. congratulations. It's called uh, Soccer Town USA. The tunnel is a really important moment because the tunnel is the place where you, you get to feel out the other team. I look at a Carlos Valderrama, a Pibe, and I'm thinking, I haven't seen that much focus in a player and an athlete ever, ever. His eyes were like steel. We realized right away that, that, that this was the game that we had to get it done. The future of American soccer was really very much at stake. But now we're playing against a team that has been picked as one of the favorites to win the World Cup, Colombia. The favorite in the group had just lost their first game and needed to win this game to stay in it. If we beat them, we knock them out. You know, we're out in California. It's 90,000 people. There's Colombia. They're picked to win the World Cup. Our three guys were leading the charge for U.S. soccer in probably the biggest game in U.S. soccer history. Columbia attacked and attacked and attacked early. We don't give a shit. We got three guys from our hometown. I think we're going to win. There was a small town where the people were sort of insane about soccer. Yes, because they were beaten down. The people in that town felt maybe they had a raw deal or they had a tough deal. They're hard workers and, you know, blue collar and, and, and it was them against the world. You see three players come from the same area, the same program, the same town, and they get to the big stage of playing in multiple World Cups. That, from a, a town of less than 35,000 people, is mind-boggling. We started saying, well, what's going on in Carney? Where's this place Carney? What's Carney producing? Maybe I would have been a better player if I grew up in Carney. Just outside New York City, Inside of the Empire State Building, but a world away, is Kearney, New Jersey, once called the cradle of American soccer. Immigrants came to work in the town's massive thread mills in the late 19th century, and they brought soccer with them. 
the game was soon sewn into the fabric of their everyday lives. This is where that tradition began. On what is now a parking lot, used to stand old Clark Field, a gravel field built by the owners of the Clark Thread Company for the people of Kearney. Kearney is Soccer Town, USA because it has the passion, it has the culture, it has the history. Soccer has been in Kearney for as long as it's been anywhere. I'm currently the seventh generation of soccer players in this country. The immigrants that, that lived in Cooper's Block, that worked in the mill, were the pioneers. They were the originals, the trailblazers of the game in the United States. The working class occupations that brought people together and made them work very hard indeed to the point where the relaxation that they needed, the entertainment part of their lives was so often centered around a soccer team. My great-great-grandfather came over from Scotland to work in the mills, the ONT mills. He played in the first ONT game in 1883. The first American soccer dynasty was the Clark Threadmills team. ONTFC won the American Football Association Cup three times in a row from 1885 to 1887. The USA and Canada played an international friendly at Clark's Field in 1885, almost 10 years before soccer would officially make it to Brazil. Jimmy Douglas uh, loved soccer so much, he, he left school, uh, didn't even make high school. He just went out and played. My great-great-grandfather, Davy Brown, was a center forward for the New York Giants. In the 1926-27 season, he scored 53 goals. He was the first American homegrown soccer star. Archie came from Glasgow, Scotland in 1910 and started playing professionally at the age of 14 for the Scots American. After scoring 67 goals in 44 games, people began referring to Archie Stark as the Babe Ruth of American soccer. I always had a great bunch of boys playing with me. Mm -hmm and they almost put it in your pocket. Archie Stark and Davy Brown played for the national team several times. And when the USA sent a team to the first World Cup in Uruguay in 1930, the attacking duo were among four local players invited. Archie declined an invitation to the first World Cup as he was starting a business back at home. And at the time, being the first World Cup, I don't think anyone really knew what it was all about. My grandfather, Jimmy Douglas, produced the first World Cup shutout in 1930 against Belgium. The score was three to nothing. Jimmy Douglas earned another shutout against Paraguay. Tom Flory, a midfielder from Harrison, captained a team that finished in third place. Flory played again in 1934 in Italy, but the most famous World Cup result for the U.S. was its shocking 1950 upset of England. That would also mark the national team's last appearance in the tournament for generations. In Kearney, though, immigrants kept coming. And when they arrived, they sought out two things, work and soccer. Ethnic teams and leagues thrived. Soccer was very ethnically driven at that time. Either you played for the Scots or the Italians or the Germans, you know, or the Brazilians, or, you know, you played for teams that you had some affiliation with. Because we played the Roma, we played the Maritimo, you know, the Germans, the Irish, you know. So we played in the World Cup every week. It was great, you know. There was no other town in America that had that. They would have three generations of people who had played and had those stories of, uh, you know, being the hero in the game or being the goat. And uh, they had that. Though soccer continued to thrive in Kearney, the rest of the town was experiencing tough times. By the 1970s and 80s, the mills which had once had the power to pull thousands across an ocean, had closed. Along with unemployment came alcoholism and drug abuse. I mean, we could go through a laundry list of guys that are no longer with us that were guys that got caught in the trap, the small town trap, and got caught up in the booze too much or the drugs. In the 19, late 1970s, Kearney was the number one heroin outlet in the metropolitan area. We were just hardened by the environment around us. We had no choice but to go meet the environment. Are we gonna get lost in Kearney? Or are we gonna find our way through the game of soccer? Down at the Scots American Club, several fathers decided to create a youth soccer club for the boys and girls of Kearney. 
Why well, we chose Thistle because it was a Flower Scotland. Thistle FC, the Thistle Football Club, not the Thistle Fish and Chips, which was up the road. All these coaches that were there because they were volunteer, because they loved the game. And they passed that love on to us. In any societies, great athletes come from places, whether it's a, a local gym, a YMCA, or some kind of small, functional place for the kids. This was the epicenter for us. We had these parents that cared about us. And so they saw us growing up like the, you know, the Lost Boys or the Outsiders, and they thought, we gotta keep them in soccer because <laughs> that'll keep them organized and disciplined. Youth soccer didn't exist yet, really. I mean, it really wasn't, you know, the youth soccer we see today that it's so organized and so vast. It was just beginning in those days. When we played for Thistle, we came into a bar to meet as a team of 12-year-olds. The bar was covered in smoke. Guys were all cursing at each other, talking about soccer, telling stories about the past. Whole nother world when you walk through the Scots Club. I walked in there and it was soccer games going on on the screen on a Sunday morning and we had a meeting place, kids playing pool, kids shooting darts at the dartboard, dad sitting at the bar, just hanging out, watching the game. For me, going into the Scots American Club was like a second home. You grow up in the Scots American Club. I had a VW bus and I had 14 kids in the VW bus. Two tons of steel running up the highway, you know, with a bunch of corny kids that are off of their head as it is. It's a day out for us. We're getting a ride up the highway today. Part of the event was, you know, the journey to the game. We'd start to sing songs and make up songs about the driver. Nobody wanted to play fucking corny back in the day. We loved to go to rich towns. Oh, let's go there and fuck that town up. All the little rich kids running around, well, we're playing corny. We were the dirtbags. I hate to say it, but everybody considered us dirtbags, lower class. It was a tougher neighborhood. You rolled into the Gunnel Oval, and there was just field after field, and it was just packed with kids, and you knew that this was a, a soccer hotbed. You come back, you want to go down the basement in the Scots American Club and take a shower. The stairs are old, busted concrete on the way down. When you get down there, it's all the bar equipment that maybe was from the 1960s that's still down there. It was an absolute mess. We had to rush down the stair, which we called the dungeon. They were lucky to get out of that. I don't know how they made it. It was at Thistle FC that John, Tab, and Tony first became teammates. John joined at the age of six, playing for his father. He often got hand-me-downs from his older brother, Jimmy. I was a small runt, and my brother was like six foot two, six foot three, and coming out of high school, and his shoes were big. So I had to stuff him with newspaper. And it didn't help my touch but that didn't give me any excuses. They were all like, ah, just get on with it. Those are the boots you're wearing and suck it up and get on. And then that's what you did. You found ways of surviving. He lives the same distance from St. Cecilia's Wall as I do, but in the opposite direction. So every day we would meet, we would call on the old school phones, uh, call to say, hey, I'll meet you up there at five to eight. He was always late, to be honest with you. He was probably fixing his hair. That's where a lot of our friendships started, on the soccer field when we were young. We went from recreation to Thistle and there was always just that drive, so you knew at that time that John was a very special player. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd right, like to introduce the trio of the Poison Pygmies. Number one, John Hawks. Is he's never nervous. He's never scared. He's always got this aura of, I'm just going to win. He had this crazy confidence about himself. He was a little guy, extremely skillful, and he played the game like the right way. And I thought, wow, it would be so great to have him on my team because we could combine and nobody would be able to stop us. As John Harks was beginning to make his name in the area, word got out about another soccer phenom, a recent arrival from Uruguay who had been playing down in neighboring Harrison. He was shy, quiet, and angry that he had come to the United States. Soccer was my friend, soccer was my life. Soccer was everything to me. I remember telling my dad when I moved here that of all the countries in the world, why did I have to move to the country that doesn't have soccer? Tabaret Ramos, he was, I think, maybe 10 or 12 years old when he came over here, and he was playing down in the courts in Harrison. 
there's a kid down here. He said, he's unbelievable. He said, you've got to come down and see him. Carney had the best players, uh, and they took me on a trial to Thistle, and I remember showing up, and they put me in uh, at, uh, at center forward. So all of a sudden, at practice one day, Bobby Craig says, this is Todd Ramos. He's going to be joining our team. And we're all like, oh, who's this kid? And after five minutes, we're like, yeah, OK, we'll take him, coach. Within about a minute, you saw that he was good. This is, this is a good, good way for me to make new friends. You know, I had been pretty much alone for the past year, year and a half, uh, trying to find my way through soccer. And fortunately, uh, maybe this would open the door. Like a modern day Messi, he would beat three or four, five guys on a dribble, chip the keeper. And we're just looking at each other like, this is insane. Like, who is this guy? The one culture that we had on the field was soccer. And so regardless of where they were from, they had a passion for the game. And that's something that I had. So there was that immediate connection. So I became the Wii Man. Mr. Magic, have a Ray Ramos. Yeah. Tony Miola was also the son of immigrants. There was a, a complex being built in Kearney and was an opportunity for my dad to own his first house and only be just a couple miles away from where he had just opened up his barber shop. And he decided that Kearney was going to be where we landed. Tony's nickname was Meatball. He had that nickname, obviously being Italian. We'd go to his house and his mother would cook. She made some great meatballs, so it seemed to stick. My mother was Mama Meatball when she came to me. My mother loved it. I hated it. Uh, but she thought it was the coolest thing when they would say, hey, Mama Meatball, how you doing, you know? And became a goalkeeper because he was the big guy. He was the biggest guy, and we didn't want him in the park. So stick him in goal, and it turns out he was uh, pretty special. With John, Tab, and Tony on the team, Thistle FC won state cups and traveled abroad to compete. And the boys got a glimpse of where their talent could take them if they could avoid the Carney Trap. More guys would have made it if uh, they could have taken a little of the Carney out of themselves. You know, some of the influences that we brag about and think are great were also uh, hurtful to <laughs> someone who wanted to be a professional athlete, for certain. In a tough neighborhood, you're, there's access to alcohol, drugs, things like that. Players that were older than I had been fantastic players, but you could see maybe their careers or those opportunities, windows of opportunity closed because they didn't take the right path. Sad to say, uh, out of the team that I took to Scotland, I think there's four or five of the kids that are not here anymore. You, you really get to know them, as, you know, as your own children, so to speak. Soccer Town USA also birthed a vibrant street soccer scene. On most nights, hordes of players trekked to an asphalt playground where they played pickup games for hours. It was a testing ground where skill and passion mattered. It was a place where players were forged in the cauldron of competition. We had training at Thistle every Tuesday and Thursday, but we played soccer three times a day before we even went to training. Played before school started. We played at lunchtime, and then we played after school. We played so much pickup, there was always a place to play. We were always playing five-a-side, small-sided soccer, so there was no hiding out there. You had to participate. You had to be involved in the games. Uh, if you were hiding, you're going to get exploited. You're going to lose. That's a major difference in what we do today. There's no, there's no pickup. Um, where back then, we lived on it, where winners stayed on. So that competitiveness, that, that edge, that drive to win, it's one of the greatest things we learned in Carney. We all kind of lived in different neighborhoods. So I was in the Hoyt Street playground. John Harks, Mike O'Neill were in the Washington schoolyard. Billy Gaka, Thomas McEwen were up at the Schuyler School playgrounds. And Mike would always kind of pick the best player from each one. And we would go down the courts from there. My nickname was Make a Deal O'Neill. That was the nickname they gave me. And I got that nickname because I made things happen. Mike O'Neill was called Pinky because he was Pink. When the sun came out, Mike O'Neill started making the phone calls. Wear white. 
and we go in white, and then there would, there would be a group of us together, and that was the chemistry that day. I would reach out to players and say, look, we're gonna be in purple today. So we'd show up in purple, and that would be our team. So we would uh, you know, step on the court and you know, kick ass all, all day, and, and then we would walk off. From where I lived in Corning was a two-mile trek down to the courts, and it was no soccer moms then. You hoofed it. But people came from everywhere to play, and it was all ages. And it was a place where you really had to survive. When school got out, it was religion that you went to the courts at night. It's 20-foot high fences on concrete, so it's like going into the Thunderdome. Inside the cage where one team wins and the other team walks. It was a very rough and ready place, and it was highly competitive. It was win or stay on. If you could make a name at the courts, you knew that you were doing the right thing. You want to be king of the court, uh, you know, that night, that day, whatever you're going down, you didn't want to get off because you knew you're going to be waiting a long time to get back on. I probably learned more about competing before I was 10 years old than I did any other stage in my career. That's where the, the foundation of competing came for me and never wanting to lose. Playing up and, and competing and winner stay on mentality. I mean, that was just it. That was the game. We definitely were playing with holes in our sneakers, you know, very similar to playing in the barrios in Argentina or the streets in Glasgow or wherever it is. All the best players in the world always come from those environments, don't they? Because they're the hungriest guys. The biggest thing about Corny, how we learned to win, was competing against each other. We basically kicked the shit out of each other in the schoolyards. It wasn't uncommon that you're walking off the field with really, you know, banged up elbows and knees and raspberries on the side of your hips from guys slide tackling on concrete. It was absolutely insane, but, you know, the, the magic comes from those moments. I credit a lot of my development to the Harrison courts, you know, playing with no coach. This was an invention, a creation, an activity, an enjoyment of the kids themselves. They selected the teams, they made up the rules, they decided who was doing it wrong and who was doing it right. No one forgets those days. I've played games that I'm, I guarantee you I've forgotten my professional career, and um, I can tell you just about everything that happened at the courts. Over and over, the cycle continued. Play, pass out, eat, wake up, phone calls. What colors are we wearing? What T-shirt are we getting on today? Do you have one in your drawer? Take it out. Steal your brothers. Whatever you got to do, <laughs> let's get out there and play. The boys grew up on club ball and street soccer, but they all dreamed of wearing the cardinal red of Kearney High. When we grew up, it wasn't about football or basketball in our town. Soccer was the cool thing to do. I don't think I had any friends that weren't soccer players, and I don't think I really hung out with anybody that couldn't play. In the 80s, high school soccer was everything. I had a motorcycle in those days. Well, I got on a motorcycle and headed for Carney or Harrison to see one of those high school games. Because they were so much more real, and I felt so much closer to the game as I'd understood it. We're the opposite way now. With this wind at our back, they're going to have difficulty coming back. You know where their weaknesses lie? That right back on their side is extremely weak. Goalkeeper's very weak. You played at Franklin Field when I was in high school. That also, like the courts, had like a 30-foot fence around it. And inside the confines of the fence was this really beat-up field. They definitely drank, they spit, they yelled, they knew everybody's name, and it would even get slightly violent. But Carney Harrison, that's your, that's your border. That's your town next over. And so bragging rights were huge with that. It's, it's probably not a greater rivalry in the game of soccer anywhere in the country. Okay, this is the mecca of soccer. Harrison and Carney, two great teams with long tradition. We're in the middle of the bus. No one's sitting. We're all standing up, and we're rocking the bus and swaying the bus back and forth. And the bus would be going side to side, and the bus driver would be going crazy, like, you're going to tip this thing. And it's just this humming, this reverberation of Carney. And it's just haunting, and it just gets louder and louder as we get closer to the stadium. And we, by the time we pull up and that door opens, we are screaming Carney at the top of our lungs. Carney! 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 I would think that the perception when we rolled into town was probably, I hate these guys. Carney was the worst fucking nightmare.
So it got to the stage where our athletic director, Carney High, started getting upset about it. So he put an article in the paper, we don't need any more hooligans. This is not who we are as Carney. That was like adding gasoline onto a fire because from that point on, they called themselves the hooligans. They made up t-shirts, they made up banners. And for us, it just made it more exciting. In 1982, Carney High played in another state final. Two eighth graders, Tony Miola and Sal Rosamilia, traveled on a fan bus to Princeton University. We got out of school early. The game was probably two o'clock in the afternoon down in Princeton, an hour plus ride on the bus, singing songs, having a keg of beer in the back. We learned more on that bus maybe than we've learned the rest of our life. Tony and I are sitting there like, you know, two awestruck kids. What are we doing here? But we were thrilled that we weren't in school. There were kegs, there was food, there was singing, and, and there was anger in their voice, you know, about the game. And, we would overtake stands at every away game that we were ever at. It's just a sea of carny. We would play away and have more people there than the home teams did. It was like we never played away. Freehold Township taking on the Cardinals of Kearney. Kearney at 21-1-1 and on the season. Freehold Township at 22-1. and Joe, the two teams appear to be very well evenly matched. The pristine Princeton University, and the hooligans show up behind the goal of the guy from Freehold. Let's get down to the PA announcer right now. Starting goal, Grant Pearson. Everybody piles off the bus, immediately finds the other team's goalkeeper. And we all, hundreds of us, rows deep, sit behind the goalkeeper as he's warming up for the game. They find out the goalkeeper's name is Pearson. And the chance went from there. The worst thing that this kid ever did in his life was have his name on the back of the jersey. Second worst thing he ever did in his life was have double zero. So it was easy. I chanted, Pearson sucks for four quarters in the game. In between quarters, they would march directly across the field with their kegs of beer, with their Scottish flags, with their American flags, and their Carney flags. We followed him from goal to goal. We chanted, Pearson sucks, and he's a zero. You can stop him, it was like uh, 200, 300 people marching across the field. Now it's Bill Mills for Carney, taking on Grant Pearson in a penalty kick. 9.36 to go, here it comes. And Carney leads it one to nothing as Mills tucks it away in the corner. It goes right along with that whole Carney attitude, just came in and owned the place somehow. The fan is the 12th player. And so that Carney army, wow, it was always the 12th player. And if you see the footage, I'm sitting right next to the goal. I can't get any closer. Hey, Grant, if you're out there, man, I, I hope you're all right, buddy. Uh, I, I hope you're doing okay. Carney High won state titles in 1981, 82, 84, and 87. The undefeated 1984 team finished the top-ranked team in the country. There was the excitement of, of being undefeated, the excitement of being number one in the country. We hop in the bus, we make our way back to Kearney. We come off the turnpike, there is a police escort waiting for us. We get off 15W, we think we're getting arrested, like, all right, who's doing something? We're looking around the bus like, you know, who got in trouble today? Bring us into Kearney, take us up and down Kearney Avenue where people are waiting and cheering the team on and... The kids surely probably had a party somewhere. The plan for the night was that we were gonna have a big party in the meadows behind the Gunnel Oval. Not the safest place to be partying, it was all basically chemical dumps. Lighting a big bonfire, hanging out, kicking a ball around, telling the stories about the game, who scored, how they scored. Oh, remember that run up the side? Oh, unbelievable that ball. Who wants that feeling to end? We're singing like crazy. All the cheerleaders are out there. We're all having our solo cups of beer from the keg, and we're having a great time. There's probably enough kids there with a good head on their shoulder that keep it safe. All of a sudden, the fire starts. One of our freshman players, Tommy Mara, decides that it's a good idea to try to start a bonfire with a mattress. What happens is the police show up, and what they recognize is that it's the Carney soccer team. When they realize it's us, they just make sure we're okay, and 
and off they went. But Tommy Mara, unfortunately, had to go on the lam for a couple of days. He wasn't in trouble with the cops, but everybody else was really pissed off at him because the police took all our beer that night. The following year, ninth graders Tony and Sal joined the varsity team and helped continue Carney High's dominance as they split time and goal. Tony was also an excellent field player, so when he and Sal were seniors, the All-American goalkeeper let his best friend play in goal. Tony played striker and led the state in scoring. Kearney High School had gotten the best players from Thistle and the courts, and now they were the best in the country. With the Kearney Army behind them, they were ready for their next challenge. We are the boys of Kearney, we aren't very neat. We never wash our underwear, we never wash our feet. Carry knives and pistols and other weapons too. We are the boys from Kearney, and who the hell are you? So who the fuck are you? Doodle doo. The dream was to play professionally for the Cosmos in Giant Stadium. The Cosmos country phenomenon of the old North American Soccer League hit Kearney hard. There's a festive atmosphere at Giant Stadium as a Soccer Bowl record throng of almost 75,000 turns out to see the Cosmos meet an old nemesis, the Tampa Bay Rowdies. If you take the back roads from Kearney, you're really only five, 10 minutes away from Giant Stadium. Just down the road, I have the mecca of soccer in this country. And so it was a world all-star team coming together and playing in our backyard. How lucky were we? The Cosmos was the dream for us. The Cosmos, to play in Giant Stadium, to play in a a packed stadium, which was essentially our home. That was the dream. We had the best role models you could ask for as street soccer players, and we would all just go back to our playgrounds afterward and we'd pretend we were those guys. So it wasn't uncommon after a Cosmo game, we'd all go back to our local playground, and I was Carlos Alberto for the day. Someone was, whoever claimed it first was Pele, you know? like That had a massive influence on me as a player, because I thought, one day I want to do this. I thought, personally, you know, why not me next? And I'm sure John thought the same, and and Tab and a and hundred other guys that played in Kearney thought the same thing, why not me next? Truth be told, lots of American kids didn't play in the NASL, a league dominated by overage foreigners. Some called it the non-American soccer league, but four locals made it, including Harrison's David DeRico, as well as Kearney's Eddie Austin, Santiago Formoso, and Hugh O'Neill. Santi and Huey grew up together on Highland Avenue. In 1976, the neighbors both played for the Hartford Bicentennials and lined up against Pele's Cosmos at the Yale Bowl. I didn't start that day, and once I came on, they were chanting my name, and opportunity presented itself, and I was able to knock one into the net, and on my way back to the center circle, Pele rubbed my head and said, you did good, boy. After their time together in Connecticut, Hugh moved on to the Memphis Rogues. But Santiago returned home to play for the Cosmos. He got to live the dream of every local kid who ever set foot in Giant Stadium and played on Carney Day. Carney Day was the biggest event. I mean, because not only did the families and all the dads that coached us and helped raise us, the whole Carney came over, bus loads, cars, caravans, whatever it was. And, just took over the parking lot section. We met in parking lot 13B and we hung out and played soccer two, three hours before a game. I'd like to think we kind of invented tailgating at soccer games. <laughs> Formoso was at left back for the, the Cosmos uh, on Carney Day and the Cosmos won three to two. Who scores the game-winning goal? Santiago Formoso. You could not have written a better script. I said, I have to do something special because I felt like this was not just your a soccer team. This was something else. It's just the Rolling Stones on tour, you know, and the Grateful Dead combined. Someone would get the word out that like, oh, Santi's coming by this town to go visit his aunt or whoever it was, and we're like, Dad, we see him, and there's his car, and it was a big flash, you know? It was all about 
Look at Santi, his hair's flowing everywhere. He was like a rock star for us. And I'd wait for his black Corvette to come down the block, follow it for about a block and a half, wait for him to park, say hello, get an autograph. The fact that Santiago Formoso lived around the corner from me growing up, it was inspiring to me as a player. To have this in your backyard for a kid growing up in Kearney must have been heaven. It, ha it had to be. And I think that's what encouraged them to play. When I was a senior in high school, I was drafted by the Cosmos. Here I have my opportunity in front of me to finally go pro, which is what I had wanted since I was seven or eight years old. But it was not to be. Although we trained with the club at Giant Stadium, the team would fold along with the rest of the NASL a year later in 1985. Tab never played for the Cosmos. The sport has just taken off and I've grown to love it and so has everybody else. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, the NASL and the Cosmos just no longer existed. When the Cosmos were it, you felt like soccer in America was taking off. And then all of a sudden, it went away and there was no real pro league. And a lot of us kind of got left behind. We played since we were five, six years old. And there wasn't a time we didn't have a soccer ball when we were kids. Could these guys be right? Are we foreigners? Are we misfits? Do we not belong? And it was really, really sad. It's hard to, it's hard to explain how sad it was, huh? The dream was over. I mean, we were gonna be stuck playing at the courts for the rest of our life. With no chance to go pro, Tab, John, and Tony went to college, but they continued to play for youth national teams, and all three earned a call-up to the senior men's side in the summer of 1989. What was left after the early 80s was only the national team program. The ultimate goal was to be a player for the national team. They scouted the best players they could find from that generation, a generation that unfortunately got almost strangled at birth. Tom and I experienced playing in the 1983 Youth World Cup together. Already, he was a, a star player at that stage. We then adopt John Harks. Where's he from? He's a Carney. Isn't that where you're from? Like, yeah, I'm from Carney. Like, There's another player from Carney? We don't even know where Carney's at. We had no pro league, so that was a real detriment to us. A lot of good players that played indoor soccer did not want to come out and play for the national team. It was a $5 a day per diem, and then it grew to 10 to 15. Lack of resources, lack of funding. You know, there wasn't a lot of money there and stuff, but to, to us, it didn't bug us. I mean, because we already grew up with that in our own system. While John and Tab left semi-pro teams to join U.S. soccer full-time, Tony was starring at the University of Virginia. In the summer of 1989, a series of injuries left the national team in need of a goalkeeper. John and Tab put in a word for their old friend and teammate. I had a, a much bigger advantage walking into the national team than either Tab or John did because they were walking in blind. I was walking in with two guys that I'd been playing with for a lot of years. We started saying, well, what's going on in Kearney? Where's this place Kearney? What's Kearney producing? Back at the Scots American Club, proud townsfolk raised pints to our half of the national team and joked, there must be something in the water. The young USA squad inched closer to World Cup qualification by November 1989. Hit for Rory. Left it for Ramos. Shot, score! Ramos! This was the battle for the last spot in the World Cup. And here we are with an opportunity in 90 minutes to do something that hadn't been done in this country in 40 years. The scenario was the same as the courts. Trinidad was win or you go home. And it all came down to a must-win game in Trinidad and Tobago. As soon as we landed, you could see there was a three-day national holiday celebration festival. The whole nation was in red. This is the most important thing to us in, in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. And we're here to support it with everything, heart and soul. They already were on the Monday declaring it a national holiday because their anticipation of getting the necessary result to go to the World Cup in Italy. That was a given. So we had two nights of partying outside the hotel and our rooms being right at ground level. You couldn't sleep, earplugs at night and asked to change rooms and it was the most uncomfortable they could possibly make us. They opened the gates at 10 o'clock in the morning. 
And the people went in there and were partying up. And when the real people came for the tickets, they couldn't get in the joint. And there were soldiers knocking them off the walls or climbing over. We like a good party. We do. We like to party. And I think because the country never experienced it yet, I think we all start celebrating before we even play the match. By the time we arrived, the stadium was packed. There were people trying to sneak in every which way. It was just absolute chaos. Our bus is completely surrounded by a sea of red. There's nowhere to go. And I've got people screaming at me. And I'm thinking, man, this is what a task this is to get done. The scene in the stadium was unbelievable. There was a lot of pressure on the US team. It was a stadium full of Trinidadians. It was parents and friends of the players who went there. The friends and family who couldn't make it to Trinidad and Tobago made their way to the Scots Club to watch the game on TV. No one played darts that day. So this place was packed. You know, you couldn't, you barely could, you know, find a spot to stand up in. And, you know, the whole crew was here. They were always with us in spirit. Everywhere we went, they were with us. And so, yeah, we played for ourselves to win and to be successful, but we were also playing for them all the time. And when you play for somebody else, that can sometimes push you on to greater heights. This is the most important 90 minutes in the history of the players on the U.S. national team. Now it's really a test. The test of very young men in very, very intimidating circumstances. Do they have the courage, the determination, and those kinds of American competitive qualities? Will they work here today? I really wanted the ball. Uh, so I come over to the other side of the field. I receive uh, thrown from Brian Bliss. It said you must wear red or you wouldn't be allowed to enter the stadium because that's all you see here. It's just a sea of red. Ramos putting it in to Calajuri. The field is a shithole. It's a cow pasture. And the ball's bounce, bounce, bounce. And we're like, oh, what's he going to do with it? He's probably going to give it away. Because the ball is bouncing, he takes a touch forward. And then he unleashes this shot. Beats the first man. A left-footed shot. Well, if you really want to be honest about it, I'm saying to myself, what's he doing? He shouldn't shoot from there. It's too far. I struck it well. I knew it was on goal. I knew it was had a chance. A left-footed shot. Paul Calajuri has scored a goal in the USA. Lead one nothing. There was this immediate eerie feeling in the stadium where, like, it just goes quiet. <laughs> People in the place going ballistic. Hey, we're going, we're going. That might be the shot heard around the world. Me and Gawker called it the shank heard around the world because he did shank it. They hopped up on his, who cares? We're going to the cup. Who gives a crap if it hit off whatever part of his body? We're going. Hey, Thomas, I didn't shank that shot. Carlos Jury took that ball with the left foot. When I seen it going in the back of the night, I says, here we come, World Cup. Tab Ramos at the 31st minute are trying to hold on and go to Italy, and they do! The USA has realized the dream. They will qualify for the World Cup in 1990. Unbelievable, unbelievable. It was surreal. When the referee blew the whistle and the game was over, you don't even know what to think. It's a sense of relief, sense of accomplishment, sense of, let's go to Italy from here. Gosh, that was the most important game for us because it did change our lives. That was the beginning. That was the launching pad of let's get soccer back again. So after the match, the door swings open and the guy comes in and said, how'd the U.S. make out today? And the bartender says, the boys done brilliant. They beat two countries in one day, Trinidad and Tobago. This video features the USA World Cup soccer team who've made the World Cup for the first time in 40 years. Hooray! For the first time in 40 years, we're here. The object is clear and victory is near. Yeah, it's in the air. Can't you tell? It is such a sweet, sweet smell. The USA, we're going all the way. We didn't come to fool around. We're here to play. So let's get busy and let's work together. Good results for a strong endeavor. It took us one score, plus one more. Now the U.S. is knocking at the door. It took us a while, but we're here, so what's up? We plan to go home with the World Cup. Yes, screamed the Soccer America cover. The global soccer community now had to welcome the USA to the biggest party on the planet.
but it gave a bunch of college kids no chance at survival. Facing Italy and Rome, people said, would be like throwing the young Americans to the lions. They would be torn limb from limb. Every time we went and played internationally, there was always a curiosity, what, what is the US team like? How good are these guys? Can they play? What are they doing across the pond over there? Do they play? They don't even call it football. They call it soccer. The 1990 World Cup really felt like we were a tourist and won some sort of fantasy competition in which you get to actually play against all the best players in the world. We sent essentially a, a college team to the World Cup. It, it wasn't a, even a question of them being not good enough. It was a question of being totally inexperienced in the adult world of professional soccer. First game was a disaster. Counterattack from oh. the United States. Tab Ramos being jerked around out there, no whistle from the official. We were taking on the big checks, and they were massive and strong and busting out of their shorts and their shirts. And we learned we, we can't be naive. We can't make mistakes and not pay for them. And here we are. This is a long way from the Carney courts. And then we got to play Italy. First thing that comes to mind is, who's my dad going to root for, you know, at this point? Who, who is he going to root for when we're playing Italy at the World Cup? And they were far more experienced, extraordinary players. That was very much walking into the Roman Coliseum. I felt like the gladiators going in there and the Italians were the lions. They threw us into that arena. I really thought they were going to eat us up that night. Going into this game last night, he said we're going in with a defensive strategy. I think at halftime, 0-0. That would be a moral victory. So maybe we should redefine what victory is today for the U.S. team. The disparity in talent was extraordinary. The gulf in experience was just ridiculous. I remember feeling a sense of dread before the game, like absolute dread, like we're going to get killed. Throughout the first half, the game threatened to turn into the predicted blowout. But a missed penalty kick by Italy allowed the U.S. to go into halftime only down 1-0. The goalpost saved Viali's penalty, and Italy's swagger lost its confident stride. Now it's time to show up big time. W what's our response going to be, you know, playing against Italy? What's the response? Because it was a game that would turn us around again. That would give us the respect back again. We didn't do good. We did great for where we were at that time, and Vermees almost scored, right? There's that sequence where we almost score, and Zenga saves the ball with his backside, and I had him in the backhand and sat there. I was going to jump on the stands myself and put it. America was out, but had shown some promise for the future. The most important game for our team to think that one day we could compete with the rest of the world. The U.S. players got a standing ovation after the game. And I remember being in restaurants in 1990, being proud to be an American. You know, we almost, we almost won. We almost scored it. The USA finished their World Cup with a loss against Austria. But the results in Italy mattered little to the people back in Kearney. I had no idea that the streets would be lined with people leading into the town hall. They rolled us in in these Corvettes, and I can remember you know, them saying, ah, oh, we're, we're going to give you a key to the city. I'm thinking, give me a key to the Corvette. <laughs> It'd be a lot better, right? It was like being in a movie. You can't believe that this little town was cheering so much for us. And it can only make you think, well, what would have happened if we actually won some games in Italy? got the, the mayor on board. There's going to be a town hall reception. I'd like to thank the mayor and, uh, and the whole town of Kearney, the people, not only for being the greatest people in this country, but the greatest people in the world. And I really mean that, and thanks very much for everything. Today I was listening to WFAN, and someone called, and they said they were from Kearney. The fellow who was on that show, he said, Carney, that's the soccer capital of the United States. So you're going out and playing against experienced players who played multiple years in top pro leagues in Europe. 
and we're going in with guys that are coming from UCLA or Rutgers or NC State or UVA or whatever it might be. The guys from Kearney and their U.S. teammates now had World Cup experience. They had four years to become professional soccer players. John signed for Sheffield Wednesday in England, where he won over doubters by scoring the goal of the year in 1990 and winning the League Cup in 1991. Tab went to Spain. Tony tried his luck in England before coming back to play for the Fort Lauderdale Strikers in the newly created American Professional Soccer League. For the first time in World Cup history, the eyes of the soccer world are on the United States of America as we prepare to open the 1994 World Cup. We weren't sure that the World Cup was going to be successful. In fact, we were frightened to death. FIFA awarded the World Cup to the United States in 1988, so the pressure to qualify for the 1990 tournament had been immense. While U.S. soccer could be proud of making it to Italy, the squad's underwhelming performance meant that expectations were low for 94, both on and off the field. We were in a situation where we knew that going into that World Cup, every host nation had qualified into the second round of a World Cup. We knew that it was going to be incredibly difficult for us. On the eve of the first match against Switzerland in Detroit, John wanted to sleep, but Tony couldn't turn off the television. Night before the game, let's get some rest. What do I do as a professional? Well, we gotta shut it down, man. We gotta get our proper rest and be prepared. It was O.J. Simpson in this chase down the California highway. 20, 30 minutes go by, and I'm hearing the TV in the background. I'm thinking, yo, Tones. What are you doing? I couldn't believe this was happening, and, and he kept yelling at me, and we got a World Cup game, and it's early tomorrow. What you want to do? Togetherness and unity means victory for you and me. With intellect and self-respect, attain whatever you want to get. Togetherness and unity. I will always remember the game in Detroit at the Silver Dome as being the hottest game I've ever played. It was very humid. If you can imagine putting everybody in a box outside in the sun, and it was unbearable. They opened with a tie against Switzerland. OK, it's not a win. That was the game that people felt they should win. This goal showed that the United States truly had arrived on the world stage in soccer because it was a masterpiece. The United States picked up their first points at a World Cup since 1950. Carney Army headed for California after the opening match. They were there to watch their childhood friends and root on the USA in a dream matchup against Columbia in the Rose Bowl. A few of us, before it started, we quit our jobs because we knew we couldn't take a month off of uh, work. It seemed like the entire town of Kearney was in Los Angeles. Everywhere you went, no matter what store, no matter what restaurant, it was like you were on Kearney Avenue and seeing all your buddies. We're out there for a week, and we took over a pub. I don't think anybody slept. You're hanging out with everybody you grew up with. It was a party that went on for seven days. Tony had a sponsored family out there. It was a doctor and his wife. So they arranged yellow school buses to get us from the hotel to the Rose Bowl. Ladies there, OK. Thomas McEwen, you're in seat 4A. Your lunchbox sandwich there. And I'm like, oh, I'm out, lady. We're all on the same friggin' bus. And we're getting kegs, and we're going to the game. And all of a sudden, there's a guy with a drum walking by, a Colombian guy. We got money. We're on vacation. We need that fucking drum. Pretty much attacked the guy and, uh, hey, come on, we'll give you money for the drum. The guy walked out of there, well, like, they made me $100 by the time we got done with him. Next thing you know, it was boom, boom. Tombo's got the drum. Now we got a regiment going into the game. You're talking about 90,000 people in a Rose Bowl, the biggest game in US soccer history. Our friends are playing in the game. Corny Army started U.S. national support of soccer. Before the Corny Army, there was a bunch of guys in the stands doing tiddlywinks and bullshit. 120 of us out there. Every one of us had American strips on. We had girls in American bikinis. We were there for a party. We knew the party was there, and we took control. And we're up against Columbia, the team that just about everybody, Pele included, had picked to win the World Cup. We're, you know, ready to go, obviously knowing that our challenge is going to be monumental because these were just great players. Columbia, 
They're picked to win the World Cup, but we don't give a shit. We got three guys from our hometown. I think we're gonna win. Once the game started, it was crazy. Columbia started coming at us like the favorite that they were. We have that one play where we kind of clear a ball off the line. I think it hit Mike Sorber, and Clavillo was involved in there. And, and I thought, OK, maybe this is the, the turning point here where we got our break. They don't score. Now we have to, we, we're going to get a break here somewhere along the way. And the Romanian keeper made a number of great saves. As Hart's now with Calagiri overlapping on the far side, sends it inside his own goal. The USA gets to score Escobar on the own goal. I looked up, I cut, and I just whipped a, a shot in as hard as I could and put it into a dangerous area. And I saw Ernie Stewart making a run on the back post of it, and I thought, oh, this will find Ernie maybe for a tap in. And the ball came off of Colombian player and then just drifted into the net. And the United States beats Colombia one to nothing. And I was celebrating like crazy, no goal. You know, unfortunately, we would find out, but that was, uh, you know, one of the worst things that could have happened to, you know, a gentleman in the game in Colombia. Ten days later, Andres Escobar would be gunned down in Medellin in what was believed to be retribution for the unfortunate own goal. The aftermath of that was unbelievable, too. To hold a grudge against them and take a man's life for a, a game of soccer uh, seemed crazy. That was crazy. The U.S. finished the first half with a one-goal lead. They opened the second, pressing for more. And Dooley in the middle. Ronaldo, the center near side to Chad Ramos. This is good possession here. Ramos sending on to Ernie Stewart, the chip. And so all I had to do was put it behind the defenders, and Ernie ran onto it, and and the rest is history. You know, Sal, my best friend, <laughs> we had sort of this crazy, I don't want to call it bet, we had this agreement, or maybe he had this agreement with me. <laughs> hey, Tone, you know, if, uh, if you get a shutout tomorrow, I'm going to do something. He's like, well, what are you going to do? I said, I think it's got to do something crazy if you get a shutout. He goes, uh, he goes, well, what? What's it going to be? I said, I'm going to jump on the field and run around, you know, take my clothes off and streak. He goes, I don't know if I want to get a shutout. It's 2 0, and there's a break in the game, and I'm looking around the stadium. I see Sal with his shirt off already. And I'm thinking, we got four minutes to go in the game. This guy's going to do it. He's just been like a big old tree trunk in the middle, and they keep going at him, trying to knock him over, and it doesn't happen. There is a ball on the ground. Saved by Miola. The chip and the score. The chip and the score at the almost the 90th minute. The world doesn't know what I did for them by uh, allowing one goal to Columbia. Well, I know you wanted the shutout. Yeah, I did. You know, if I could have it all over again, I would have pushed it wide. But he was so close to me, I was just trying to make a play. And the, the guy knocked the rebound in. But really doesn't matter at this point. We, we wanted three points out of this game. We got it. And a lot of people didn't think we could do it. So I thank Tony for allowing that goal. This is watching, you know, history happen. Tab and John and Tony, <laughs> just regular guys from New Jersey, and they delivered. We really just did that. Like, that's insane. We really just did that. We really just celebrated the biggest moment in U.S. soccer history. I remember Tony running around with the American flag afterward, and John running around. I mean, it could bring a tear to my eyes now. It was such an emotional time for us. I remember kind of turning around, and you had their parents up in the booth that were set up for them. Uh, Mr. You know, the, the Miolas, the Harks, the Ramoses, and to be able to look at them and say, oh my God, can you believe we, we did that? And then to beat up with everybody afterwards, just really, I can, I can feel it right now talking about it. Why don't you invite all your friends over to my house? And I'm like, Doc, you really, you don't want to do that. You know, that's not a good idea. They invited us in for a barbecue. We had two boatloads of hooligans basically showing up at this doctor's house. We took over this guy's house like you wouldn't believe. If you ever watch Caddyshack, when they have the, the caddies, the caddy day, they had overtaken 
his house, the whole street. They were playing soccer in the street. People were running from the backyard out of the pool, food all over the place, beer cans all over the place. I thought, these people here in Michigan have no idea what the hell just hit them. <laughs> Galka was hanging from the chandeliers. You got a few beers in him, he was like Joe Pesci on crack. The Kearney Army partied for days and then showed up at the Rose Bowl for the final group game, a loss to Romania. But the USA advanced to the knockout round where they faced powerhouse Brazil. We got the perfect draw in the round of 16, which was Brazil. No one's expected to beat Brazil. July 4th against Brazil. And you know what? We beat Colombia. They were favored. We we're ready for it. But Brazil were ready for us. We start with John out of the game. Red had been suspended for an incident that happened in setting up a wall against Romania where he got a yellow card, now has to sit out. Tab was probably our best player in the first half of that game. Tab could hold the ball. He was the only player who had the confidence to hold the ball against Brazil. Deep into the first half, with the match goalless, the USA continued to frustrate the Brazilian giants. Brazil knew what they had to do, and they did it. And everybody saw it. God-fearing moment. I mean, it was just, we gasped. It was just so bad. The way that his body fell when he got hit, the impact that it made. Leonardo's vicious elbow put the Americans a man up. I mean, I don't know what getting run over by a train is like, but it, it sort of felt that. You feel this, like, really loud noise in your head. The turning point here is we lose our best player, the most creative player, the one player that could hold the ball against Brazil is now out on injury. We're playing against Brazil. They only have 10 players, but it's like we only have 10 and a half because you can't replace Tap. By the time we got in the locker room, though, at halftime, I mean, you could tell he was in trouble. That I went to see him at the hospital, it was a very, very scary moment. He was told by some doctors after that he shouldn't play anymore. July 4th was not American soccer's Independence Day, but losing by a single goal to the eventual champion was no disgrace. Even in the loss, something important had been gained. The 1994 World Cup is the biggest turning point ever in United States soccer history. It propels us to a complete different level. I think a leap from 90 to 94 was amateur to professional. And we earn the right to say that we want to be the best, and we're on the right to say that, hey, one day we want to win the World Cup. In the wake of a successful World Cup in 1994, pro soccer returned to the United States. Major League Soccer formed in 1996, and once again, Tab, John, and Tony were soccer pioneers. Part of the, the deal was in U.S. hosting was that we would start a professional league. Uh, so the plans began for MLS, we didn't have a choice. I mean, FIFA said, we gave you the World Cup, so you create a league. Well, if the U.S. bombs out, I don't know if Major League Soccer starts. And if Major League Soccer doesn't start, a whole bunch of other things don't happen. The league was supposed to start in 94, 95. No, it's not going to start until 96. Is it really going to happen? I mean, is this really going to come together? Do we have the, the money and the ownership groups? And When I got back to Spain at Real Betis, we had just gained promotion to back to La Liga. And now the club knows that I'm going to be out for the next six months, so they obviously brought some new reinforcements, and, and now I lost my position on the team. Tab decided the time was right to come back to the Americas. He was set to sign a contract with Mexican power Tigres, but then he got a phone call about the new professional league back home. I said, Tab, you know, we're starting this league. Why don't we, instead of doing this as a signing, let's do this as a loan. So MLS will loan you to Tigres. Well, that was all okay, except MLS didn't have a league. So we were kind of loaning them out of thin air. They don't have teams, they don't have, they don't have anything. How do, I, how do I sign a contract for, like, for a league that doesn't exist? I wanted him to be the first player to uh, sign a league for a lot of different reasons. One, he's obviously an American player, World Cup star, Hispanic, and an attacking player. You put all of those things together, and it made a lot of sense for us to sign him as the first player. I thought, you know, by me signing with the league, that it would encourage other players like, you know, Eric Granola and John Horrocks and the big players that we had playing around the world, that it would encourage them to, to come and play here and to help to start the league. 
When Ted Ramos was the first player signed in the league, he's the first player we went after. When I thought about coming back home in the United States and play, I thought that I would only want to play at Giant Stadium. And playing for the Metro Stars, the area's own great star of the 1990-1994 World Cup, Tab Ramos. And obviously my number one priority was to come back to Giant Stadium where I felt like I had unfinished business. When we started uh, with the national team and then when we started in Major League Soccer, we had two jobs. One was to play and be prepared to play. The other one was to promote the game of soccer. These guys that really were giants that ended up lifting the game in the World Cup were now playing in MLS, and I was playing with them in front of 69,000 at the Rose Bowl. This, this was a dream come true. The inaugural MLS Cup between DC United and the LA Galaxy drew over 34,000 people to Foxborough Stadium in Massachusetts. Unfortunately, it also drew Hurricane Lily. The game was played in a frigid downpour, a less than ideal showcase for a new league trying to crown its first champion and win over the country. We have to pull it off because it's on live on ABC. And so we've got to get this game off. And they came from behind and beat us, and, and Harks is lifting the Rothenberg Trophy there. And I was thinking, wow, this is like, this is professional sports. It's, this is really happening. America has a professional league, and there's John Harks lifting the trophy, so. Though not without missteps, the growth of MLS since that first season has been measured in milestones. As the league has expanded, so has the popularity of the game in the United States. There are now soccer towns across the country where boys and girls dream of playing in a World Cup. Soccer is part of the fabric of the nation. We have great young players. I think we have better players than we've ever had before many of them that are really hungry to do something new and to be the next guys that'll lead U.S. soccer to something big. But the future of U.S. soccer is still being written in Kearney. The town has changed. There are more Peruvian restaurants than fish and chips shops along Kearney Avenue now. But the language everyone speaks will always be soccer. Kids still play for Thistle FC, and John Harks' brother Jimmy coaches in town as their father did. Bill Galka is the head coach at Kearney High, which remains a powerhouse, winning a state title in 2017. These days, Kearney kids dream of playing at Red Bull Arena, whether in the Kearney-Harrison rivalry game or as professionals in Major League Soccer. And of course, there's always a wait to play at the courts. Hey everybody, this is uh, Grant uh, Pearson. Played soccer in Freehold, New Jersey for the longest time. Um, hope everybody's doing well out there in the world. Uh, I hope that uh, everybody's healthy. Uh, God bless you all. And um, Freehold is definitely the soccer capital of New Jersey, not Carney.
Cold Cold.